Without further ado, I present the man of the morning, Sess. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so I've got some fun facts. We'll get started with that, fun facts. Um, anybody care to uh, guess which one is uh, not the, uh, which one is the false fact? Number 12. Which is? Elvis. Uh, no, I did. I, I was actually, I, I was actually a, uh, an Elvis impersonator on a TV show called The Dumbest Criminals. So that is, that is a true statement. Yes. Number 10, which is? Every every SEC school, that's kind of true. That's, that's it. That's it. That's it. I have not been to every SEC school. And for you, you get a copy of Gumbo for the Tiger yeah. Soul. Yeah. Gumbo for the Tiger Soul. There for you. That one will not become a movie. And uh, for the um, for the booby prize, the, for the wrong guess, Kill Pushers. Uh, which hopefully will become a movie. So uh, for those physicians out there, you know that you've been called on by pharmaceutical reps and it's, it's kind of a, uh, a very interesting a business uh, of the pharmaceutical world. But uh, I'm happy to be here this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction, Woot. Um, you know, uh, in my short time as a member here, I've seen some, some great presentations and, and uh, I'm a little nervous having to, to live up to those standards. But uh, Caleb talking about printing buildings and uh, Phil Rundell about um, cutting a ship apart that had capsized. I mean, amazing, amazing stories. And um, uh, Dr. Mark Mann and your project in the museum district, amazing and phenomenal information and so impressive. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, 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 the, the, the high rise in, in Tanglewood, just uh, um, amazing information and a great presentation. Um, Charles Cooper, stories of sales, sales 101, things that uh, refreshed my memory of, about sales and thinking outside the box and uh, telling stories, and, and that's what I'm going to do today is tell a story. And Anthony's dovetailing on Anthony's presentation from last week about leadership, and um, and what is your legacy in leadership? And that's where where I begin in, in uh, my uh, my story of leadership. And so um, I'd like to uh, thank my sponsors, Steve Mahan and Mike Dumas, otherwise known as the Breakfast Club Cycling Team. I'd like to thank uh, my CEO, Mark Woodruff, who will be the headliner here today, uh, giving us some information about the Houston real estate market in, in 2022. And uh, my wife, my number one cheerleader. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in, in my story, I'll talk about taking risks. And I took a risk, uh, went on a blind date, and... Um, and here we are, <laughs> uh, 17 years later. And so uh, uh, that, uh, that blind date ended up great, and it's all about taking chances, and sometimes uh, they, they, they work out well. And so, um, <clears throat> so my story uh, from failure to first, a story of failure, struggles, lessons learned, and the pursuit of success. And so I was born and raised in New Orleans, the son of Latin American immigrants. Uh, my mother was from Ecuador, my father from Honduras. My father was uh, a chef on the uh, seagoing vessels out of the port of New Orleans. Uh, so essentially my mother was uh, a, a single mom, before being single mom was cool. She, uh, she had to rule the house with an iron fist and she was very much a, a, discipl a disciplinarian. Um, you can see that I used to have a, a big bushy head of hair, but, um, and uh, not so much anymore. But growing up in, in New Orleans in the Deep South, uh, back in those days, it was, it was tough. It, um, I, um, you know, played out in the sun quite a bit and my skin was very dark and my mother's nickname for me in her terms of endearment was Negrito, which, um, uh, translated into English is, is blackie and so I was really really dark and I took all the all the jokes I was the darkest skinned person in the school 
I took all the uh, racial jokes. It was a struggle. It was it was very intense, and I I always wanted to belong. I always wanted to fit in. My parents instilled the uh, the American dream into me, and I I I wanted to assimilate into into our culture and into our community, and, and it was very difficult. But the wise philosophers that were around me taught me some very important. Um, sayings like sticks and stones will break my bones but words will never hurt me and I'm rubber you're glue whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you and those are just so important those stuck with me and and helped me survive in 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 the during those times in the 60s and uh, and I think that our community our country could learn a few lessons by those things and not be so offended by words and tweets and things of those natures. Uh, so uh, in 1971, uh, Saint, uh, it was All Saints Day. Uh, I, playing street football, playground football, got into a little bit of a fight with, with somebody, ended up with a black eye, and my mother hauled me into the YMCA of New Orleans the very next day and enrolled me into the judo pro program telling me that I was going to be able to take care of myself. And judo is a uh, Japanese form of wrestling. It's grappling and throwing and falling and rolling and being able to, to handle yourself and giving you the confidence of, of um, being able to uh, be very athletic and, and, uh, and, and controlling some situations. But uh, is not involved. Uh, striking is not involved. Kicking and striking is not involved in judo. But we traveled around. I, I, I really, again, I wanted to belong. I wanted to be part of a team. And um, you know, uh, we we traveled around the YMCA van. This is the middle photo. There is us in in uh, Orlando in the early 70s. We went to see uh, the uh, Disney World when it uh, had, had just opened up and. And then shortly after that, uh, the YMCA National Judo Tournament. I'm there, middle row, far right. Um, and uh, I got knocked out in the first two rounds and, and uh, kind of uh, you know, knew that I needed to improve and work at, at, at getting better. And that's what I did. And then so four years later, the, the, the Nationals come back around and, and I'm getting ready and I'm training and I'm, I'm practicing and I've been in more tournaments. and and have worked hard to, to get better. And I was in the middle of uh, training and I, I, I was working to flip one of uh, my, my teammates. And instead of getting the, the move all the way turned around and, and having him land on the mat, he landed on my wrist, broke my wrist. And I was unable to compete in the nationals in, um, I think that was 11th grade. And so it was very disappointing after working so hard and I, I didn't uh, I wasn't able to compete in the nationals but I kept working hard I kept listening to my coaches I, 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 I kept um, uh, practicing and going through the, the physical therapy to, to get my wrist back in order and uh, and, and later on in in my junior year I, I won eight tournaments consecutively and and that was uh, very gratifying that, uh, that I was able to take the leadership of my coaches and to persist and to, and to continue fighting forward. But uh, one of the, the experiences that came through the YMCA was joining the Leaders Club. And as, as a young kid, I was coaching and teaching and, and leading the, the day camps and the, and the counselors. So there I was as a young 14, 15, 16 year old, I was, I was guiding and coaching and teaching and learning about leadership. And every year at the end of the summer, we would go to a, a Blue Ridge YMCA Leader School in Black Mountain, North Carolina. I developed my love for North Carolina, uh, going to the Leader School at Black Mountain, and learned so many lessons in leadership there. Um, and, and I loved North Carolina. I forgot my point there of, of the Leader School. But um, so, so anyway, I ended up graduating from high school and my failed attempt at, at college, I was in pre-med, but uh, chemistry, I, I, I just couldn't handle it. My, my parents wanted me to be, to go to college, but they really didn't know how to prepare me. They, they were high school, 
graduates from Latin America didn't really know how to prepare me for college. So um, I came home at the Christmas break in 1976. Uh, Mom says, and you know, remember she was ruling with an iron fist. She says, uh, you know, these grades are not good enough. We are not financing this anymore. And guess who's been calling? The Army recruiter. And uh, I, I said, okay. So I went to uh, visit with the Army recruiter. He's telling me about the GI Bill, and um, uh, it, it, would, it, it was the one dated from World War II where they would pay 100% of your, your uh, college uh, education. And so uh, I took advantage of that. I enlisted and went on to boot camp. And uh, it was tough. Again, uh, part of a platoon, going through basic training. I wanted to be a part of it. I had... Uh, Learned a lot of discipline from my mother. Actually, boot camp was a lot easier than living at home. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, given the choice of, of going off to boot camp or, or living under my mother's roof, uh, I, I went to boot camp. So that was that was excellent. But uh, halfway through boot camp, uh, uh, another recruiter came through, had the beret on, had the the, the parachutist wings, it looked like a really bad hombre, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, talked about um, the 82nd Airborne Division jumping out of airplanes, and I'm just like, whoa, that's pretty scary. Um, but he said, we're station, stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I was just like, sign me up, I'm gonna go back to North Carolina. Because I had fallen in love with North Carolina in the mountains and everything. So we stationed, I was stationed at Fort Bragg uh, for, um, for four years after that. But in jump school, I ended up in jump school um, uh, in July of 1977, uh, you know, hottest month of the year, going through jump school. It was uh, a real, real suffering and, and pain. But one of the things that I had learned all along was that, uh, you know, and you guys have heard it, um, um, mind over matter. And the sergeants were, were talking about, if you don't mind, it don't matter. And so, so no matter how hot it was, no matter how painful it was, you know, mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. And I heard that over the, over the years. But um, you know, in in the training programs, it was really cool because in the military, are, are there any military veterans besides me? Awesome, awesome. Thank you for your service. Yes, awesome. They would they would uh, grade you. They would track you. They would. Uh, inspect you of course inspections every day how shiny your shoes or how oppressed your uniform was no matter how dirty and messed up it would get during the day it started out neatly and pressed and ironed and at the end of jump school I was one of ten troops that were selected for the finalists um, so we in interviewed in a room much like this we went in and interviewed they would ask us questions about various things in the military um, it, it, and particularly it, about jumping out of airplanes. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I, I, I went in, I, I was one of the top 10. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was very nervous and I did not impress them at all. And so I was just, um, just a regular guy after that, but somebody else got the, uh, the Distinguished Paratrooper Award out of that deal. But I, I pocketed it away and uh, I, Figured, figured things out later on. So after um, four years in, in, um, in, in service, well, near, near the end of my service, I was selected to go to the non-commissioned officers um, training, and um, uh, I went to a leadership program. It was non-commissioned officers, officers' primary leadership course. Um, it was for a month. It was in the month of March in North Carolina. It was pretty cold, and again, I, we were out there in our, our, our fatigues and it was cold. It was really, really cold. And again, they're, they're, they're stomping around and like, mind over matter, mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. And I'm just freezing and cold and just like, I don't mind, it don't matter. I'm, I don't mind, it don't matter. And so anyway, I just, I worked hard. I, I did everything my leaders told me to do. And um, I, again, I was selected one of the top 10 troops to go in for the interviews at the end of this primary leadership course. And so um, I did a little bit of research, I did my homework, I, I kind of asked some questions and figured out what the guys were looking for. I went in to the, uh, to the interview, went into the panel, and I was selected as the number one graduate of the, uh, 
the leadership program. It was very, one of uh, my uh, favorite accomplishments. So, uh, so anyway, um, um, they, they tried to induce me to stay. They wanted to give me flight school and everything, but uh, I, I thought back to the GI Bill and, and why I, I'd originally uh, joined the military, and that was to get the, uh, the college education. So I, I was honorably discharged in uh, February of 1981 and enrolled um, a short time later at LSU and uh, experienced uh, another setback. It was, uh, and, and as Woot said in, in, in the uh, introduction, uh, why chemistry was part of the computer science program, I will <laughs> never figure that out. But it was, uh, I couldn't handle chemistry once again, and so uh, I, um, I, I altered courses, and, and one of the professors there, uh, in, in one of my electives, the geography class, uh, uh, would always tell us about different things, and, and uh, one, of the, one, of the, one day he was talking about um, learning and knowledge and everything and, and the fact that the more you learn the more you learn that you know nothing and i think that's a, a philosophical state i don't know aristotle uh, plato one of those guys but the more you learn the more you learn that you know nothing and i always instilled in myself wanting to learn more and 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 take classes and get certifications and get licenses and take leisure learning <coughs> programs uh, whenever I, I was not um, in, in a particularly academic uh, setting. And so that's what I've always done. And it's kind of what led me into real estate later on down the road. So uh, I ended up graduating, uh, bouncing between uh, nonprofit work. I mean, the, the Bachelor of Arts degree in Geography was not very marketable. I, I couldn't really get uh, a, a high paying job or anything. So I went back to nonprofit work. I worked in the big uh, uh, big Buddy program, uh, tried um, uh, claims, insurance claims, didn't really work for me, and then gravitated to the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater, Fort, of greater uh, Baton Rouge. And there, the YMCA background, the, the leadership in the military background, it really helped me work with underprivileged kids in Baton Rouge. Um, around 1988 or so, we ended up winning five of the seven categories uh, in, um, in boys and girls clubs uh, programs in the various categories of sports and education and cultural enrichment and community service. And it's these programs that I, I directed and I helped organize that, that we won five out of seven uh, categories in, in the national organization of the Boys and Girls Clubs. I was recruited to uh, become the director of operations in Fort Worth uh, in May of 1989. I call my parents to tell them that I'm moving from Baton Rouge with my wife at the time, um, first wife, um, and at the same time my father tells me that he's been uh, diagnosed with a terminal cancer. Um, and so here I am moving away, dad's got terminal cancer, and it's a struggle. Again, another struggle that, that you're going through. And moved to Fort Worth, uh, and kind of helpless to help the family. Um, and I was there with a wife that was very unhappy that we had moved away from Baton Rouge. Um, and, and so that um, it, it ended up, and my dad passed away later on that year. I just kind of, went through emotional issues that are hard in relocation and relationships. Ten minutes? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll wrap this up and uh, the headliner, my CEO, Mark Woodruff, will, will wrap this up. But uh, so anyway, um, uh, again, the point is that we all go through through failures, through struggles, and it, it's, it, it's about surrounding yourself with great people. Uh, surrounding yourself with mentors, people that will help you get through the, those those troubled times that that we all have. So anyway, uh, because of the, the, the problems that I was going through emotionally, I, I ended up uh, having a meeting with my executive director, and um, he gave me three choices: you're either getting fired, you're going to resign, or you're going to uh, take a, a lower position in the company, in, in the organization. And so I chose the latter. I, I chose to resign, figuring out that, 
that some way that I, I would make it happen. Some way I, I would find a job, and, and I did. I, I, I had some experience, I had some leadership, I had some, I was program, uh, operations director of, of a pretty big organization in Fort Worth. I managed to um, convince um, my district manager, uh, who was with Clairol, um, to hire me in my first corporate sales job here in Houston in 1990, and that's when I moved here. And um, started, I, yeah, I st yeah, started, uh, started learning sales and um, uh, learning all kinds of sales techniques and sales programs and always pursuing excellence. And so um, uh, in, in, um, in, in, let's see, keep going, keep going on the slides. Uh, always believing that the sky is the limit uh, and, and really improving my, my, um, my education. I enrolled at HBU, got the MBA, got into direct pharmaceutical sales. And uh, for the physicians out there, you guys, you guys know what it's like to have the pharmaceutical agents calling you. I always found it a little difficult to do that, uh, inter interrupting physicians on, on their, in their, during their daily jobs. And um, as a district manager, as I worked and got uh, up in the, in the ranks of, of things, I um, uh, ended up realizing that, um, that I needed to, to move on. And so that's, that's when I wrote Pill Pushers and I got pushed out of the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> and so so uh, I, I did write that on my own time. I wrote it on my own time. It was a fictional story based upon my experience in the pharmaceutical world, um, but uh, ended up uh, pursuing the entrepreneurial world where I uh, got my real estate license and uh, went through the Better Homes and Gardens leadership program in 2018 and then in 2019 I decided to start my team and again instilling some of these things that I've learned over the years uh, uh, have uh, reached the number one status uh, in two consecutive years in the uh, River Oaks office of, of Gary Green and so um, that's my story I I'm happy to be a member here I want to belong as always, and want to add value to the organization and and um, and 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 see us be, stay at, as the, the number one breakfast club in America. And so, Mark, yeah. come on up, wrap this up with some uh, economic uh, projections for uh, Houston in the real estate market. Uh, I can't think of a, a better man to do that than the man that leads Better Homes and Gardens, Gary Green. And uh, thank you for being here, and I'll pass the baton.